Early August 1944. So far in this war, the Japanese have lived free of the pain of strategic bombing. They themselves have rained destruction from the air on civilians across the East Asian region, but have been shielded by the vast distances of the Asia-Pacific theater and a defensive ring won through imperial conquest. But now things are beginning to change. The United States armed forces are closer than ever to the Japanese islands, and they are ready to unleash the B-29 Superfortress, a strategic bomber more powerful than any that has come before. For the unprepared and until now complacent Japanese, the war is about to come home literally. The order of the day in Tokyo, Osaka, and the other big cities is evacuate. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In this week's extra episode, I will go back and look at the recent developments in the aerial bombardment in East Asia. Now, before I begin, it will be discussed in the comments anyway, so I might as well get it handled out front. Aerial bombardment of civilians was considered immoral and was illegal at the time, and the decision makers were well aware of this. Let me quote U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt's appeal to the belligerents from 1939. If resort is had to this form of inhuman barbarism during the period of the tragic conflagration with which the world is now confronted, hundreds of thousands of innocent human beings who have no responsibility for, and who are not even remotely participating in, the hostilities which have now broken out will lose their lives. I am therefore addressing this urgent appeal to every government which may be engaged in hostilities publicly to affirm its determination that its armed forces shall in no event and under no circumstances undertake the bombardment from the air of civilian populations or of unfortified cities upon the understanding that these same rules of warfare will be scrupulously observed by all of their opponents. I request an immediate reply. Note the words rules of warfare. And on that note, let me quote the British government's policy on bombardment that was issued to the commanders of the British Armed Forces at the opening of hostilities, also in 1939. Bombardment by naval and air forces is to be confined to military objectives and must be subject to the following general principles. A. The intentional bombardment of civil populations, as such, is illegal. B. It must be possible to identify the objective. C. The attack must be made with reasonable care to avoid undue loss of civil life in the vicinity of the target. D. The provisions of the Red Cross conventions are to be observed. Note the precise clarification that this applies to air forces as well. And let me repeat item A. The intentional bombardment of civil populations as such is illegal. Well, by 1944, these statements from 1939 are very much at odds with the reality of the war. In a constant escalation begun by the Axis powers, all sides have thrown the illegality and immorality of bombing civilians to the wind, and death has been raining from the sky from Bristol in the west to Port Moresby in the east. Japan's part has been to terrorize and kill Chinese civilians for over half a decade. The first victims were cities like Shanghai, Nanjing, and Beijing in 1937 and 1938. But between 1939 and 43, the main effort was directed at the new Chinese capital, Chongqing, far in the Chinese interior. Like the Luftwaffe and the Anglo-American Air Forces, the Japanese decided that if they could not take the enemy's capital by land, then intense bombing would break the will of Chongqing's population and bring the Chinese nationalist government to its knees. I covered these raids when they were at their most intense in 1941. By the time the bombing was over in August 1943, at least 11,500 civilians in the city had been killed, probably more. Another 20,000 or so wounded and 30,000 buildings had been destroyed. But despite all this destruction, just like in London and Berlin, the Japanese failed to break the morale of the population or to bring down Chiang Kai-shek's regime. Thanks to gradual improvements in air defense and the shelter of deep underground bunkers, life and work in besieged Chongqing carried on. Instead of breaking Chinese will, the bombing only increased Chinese resentment and a desire for revenge. 
a revenge the Japanese never really considered could be unleashed on them. They assumed that overseas conquest would protect the home islands from strategic bombing. At one point, Prime Minister Hideki Tojo went as far as proclaiming that preparations for homeland air defense must not interfere with the operations of our armed forces overseas. Until now, that maxim seems to have held true. The Allies have been unable to strike at the Japanese home islands in any significant way. The military insignificant but psychologically impactful Doolittle raid back in April 1942 and the small tactical strikes on the Kuril Islands in 1943 were the only exceptions. Lulled into a false sense of security, the Japanese became complacent and did little to improve their air defenses, which now lag far behind those of Britain and Germany. The Japanese may have sat on their laurels, but despite all the evidence of its ineffectiveness, the Americans were determined to bring strategic bombing to Japan. With Japanese cities consisting of densely packed homes built of wood and paper, the Americans had quickly alighted on the solution for maximum destruction – fire. In November 1941, as tensions rose with Japan, U.S. Army Chief of Staff George Marshall threatened to set the paper cities of Japan on fire. In 1943, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt called Operation Gomorra, the British firebombing of Hamburg that July, an impressive demonstration. By that point, testing was already underway on a new generation of incendiary bombs filled with Harvard scientist Louis Pfizer's new chemical, napalm. The bomb was tested in the summer of 1943 at the Dugway Proving Ground in the Utah desert. There, the Chemical Warfare Service Technical Division contracted Standard Oil to build a replica Japanese village. Antonin Raymond, a Czech-American architect, used his experience working in Japan to ensure that the village of 24 civilian homes was as accurate as possible. Standard Oil spent $1 million and used prison labor to bring this village to life. The homes were built of authentic types of wood and were fitted with traditional paper, shoji, and fuzuma screens. The homes were filled with tanzu storage chests and hibachi stoves. The tables were low and surrounded by sabuton sitting cushions. The floors were covered with traditional straw mats or tatami. Standard Oil produced an enormous quantity of tatami, but some were simply taken from the homes and businesses of the interned Japanese-American community. Over the summer of 1943, the Japanese village was burnt down and rebuilt three or four times as various bomb types were dropped on it. By completion in July 1943, the results showed that the new bomb, the M69, was far more effective than its predecessors. Almost 70% of the M69s produced roaring infernos that rapidly grew beyond the control of well-trained fire crews. At the same time, the Air Force began making plans for the strategic bombing offensive. These were based around the new B-29 Superfortress, or the Super Bomber, as the press called it. The B-29 boasts an impressive technological edge over its predecessors. For a start, its maximum speed is over 350 miles per hour, and it cruises at around 220 to 230 miles per hour, giving it greater protection against enemy fighters than the slower B-17 and B-24. It can carry 10,000 pounds of bombs, twice the normal payload of the B-17, over a combat radius of almost 2,000 miles. The B-29's service ceiling is greater than 30,000 feet, and the aircraft is fully pressurized to reduce crew fatigue. Air Force Chief Henry Hap Arnold ordered the Committee of Operations Analysts, the COA, to analyze targets in Japan for strategic bombing. When the COA reported on November 1943, their document listed six primary targets. Merchant shipping in harbors and at sea, steel production via attacks on coke ovens, urban industrial areas which are vulnerable to incendiary attacks, aircraft plants, ball bearings, the electronics industry. In the report, the COA strongly emphasized the vulnerability of the Japanese steel industry and its reliance on coke ovens located on the islands of Kyushu, occupied Manchuria and Korea. The COA wrote, The most serious long-term damage can be inflicted by disrupting the production of basic materials like steel. Those coke ovens are the prime economic targets. They should be attacked as soon as the forces necessary to destroy them in rapid succession become available. Thanks to 
intelligence and press reports, the Japanese knew that the B-29 was on the horizon. So at the end of 1943, they started taking the first small steps to prepare for bombing. In November, city authorities began destroying buildings to create 40-meter urban fire breaks. Hundreds of thousands of homes were destroyed in cities across Japan, and although the inhabitants were compensated, they were not provided with alternative accommodation. Post-war estimates put the number of people affected by these measures as high as 1.8 million. Then, in December, government ministries recommended that children and adults not involved in war work should leave Tokyo, Nagoya, Kobe, Osaka, and North Kyushu. There was little progress on this huge evacuation plan over the next few months, though. Unlike in Britain or Germany, there was no system for assigning alternative accommodation and no foster families for the children. The government simply assumed that all city dwellers could find shelter with relatives in the countryside. These evacuation plans will not reach any level of urgency until the first B-29s appear in the skies over Japan. But before that, the Allied Air Forces will inflict misery on hundreds of thousands of Chinese, but not by bombing. On April 10th, 1944, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the JCS, approve Operation Matterhorn, the plan for the strategic bombing of Japan. To prevent local and theater commanders diverting the new bombers for tactical missions, Arnold and the JCS create an entirely new structure, the 20th Air Force. Arnold takes personal command of the 20th, but before he can order the bombers into the air, they need new airfields. By the time the GCS approved matter on construction is already underway in India and China. In Bengal, 6,000 US troops and 27,000 Indian laborers build four bases around Karagpur. Existing airfields at Chakulia, Piagaba, and Tutkundi are also upgraded, as well as bases in Ceylon. American airmen who arrive in Bengal are hardly impressed. One of them writes, As we plied out of the airplane, anxious to see our new base, my heart sank. This was not the civilized war we had expected to fight, for there were no barracks, no paved streets, nothing but insects, heat, and dirt. But the Indian airfields aren't in range of Japan itself and will only be used for strikes on occupied Southeast Asia. The B-29s need to be closer to the enemy. So, a thousand miles away from Bengal, near Chengdu in Sichuan province, an army of Chinese laborers works around the clock. The conditions they endure make the Indian bases look luxurious, as the New York Times writes. In asking for these bases, Americans, as usual, wanted the impossible. At home, where mechanical equipment is abundant, 5,000 skilled and unskilled laborers would have been needed for the job. In the interior of China, there are only a few trucks and no skilled labor worth mentioning. And so the work was done here with incredible speed by hand, muscle, and goodwill on the part of 300,000 to 500,000 farmers. Well, there's little goodwill on either side of the arrangement here. The local government has dragged these people from their homes, put them to work under armed guard, and is paying them barely enough to afford food. The workers carry heavy loads of rock and sand over miles of rough terrain in baskets or handcarts. Then they build up the runways by hand, layer by layer. Hundreds die in accidents. The scale of construction is so massive that it almost shatters the economy of Sichuan province. Food prices soar as the conscripting of labor, the seizing of land, and the hoarding of tools destroys the productivity of local agriculture. But as so often in wartimes, a few people are profiting handsomely from this human misery. Chinese officials and local businessmen are thoroughly ripping off the U.S. War Department by charging hugely inflated prices for labor, tools, and materials. After months of back-breaking labor, the airfields are ready and the B-29s are launched for the first bombing mission against the Japanese home islands since 1942. The first raid is on the evening of June 15th, when the newly formed 20th Bomber Command of the 20th Air Force launches 75 B-29s from Chengdu. 
for now, the bombers are not armed with incendiaries and do not have orders to burn Japanese cities. Instead, they carry high explosives, and like in Europe, the orders are, on paper at least, to destroy Japanese industry. The first raids targets the Imperial Iron and Steelworks at Yawata and Kyushu. This plant produces almost 25% of Japan's rolled steel, and 20th Bomber Command hopes to disable it by destroying three massive coke ovens. But the mechanical problems which have plagued the B-29 mean that only 47 aircraft reach the target at around midnight. In the darkness, they scatter their bombs wildly. Only one bomb actually hits the steel plant. In return, seven B-29s are lost to Japanese fighters and accidents. The first raid is very underwhelming. It's a propaganda success more than anything else. And the B-29, the much-vaunted super bomber, does not yet make a meaningful contribution to the war. From their bases in Chengdu, 20th Bomber Command can only hit the island of Kyushu, and the force is hampered by logistical, mechanical, and command problems. They manage just one major raid every two weeks with the B-29s. The raid on Yawata is followed by a 14-bomber raid on Sasebo on July 7th and a 29-bomber raid on Nagasaki on August 10th. In between, the bombers also hit targets in occupied China, and B-29s based in Ceylon hit targets in occupied Indonesia. The Chengdu-based B-29s will return to Yawata on August 20th for another ineffective raid against the coke ovens. Those raids show once again the futility of high-altitude Allied strategic bombing. On the other side, the Japanese have by now largely switched to attacking the American bases in China. Here, the Japanese run into the stiff defenses of the American 14th Air Force and a Chinese Nationalist Air Force that is better trained and equipped than the days of Chongqing in 40 and 41. This only accelerates attrition, attrition that the Japanese, with their lack of fuel, raw materials, and trained pilots, cannot overcome. But like the Luftwaffe, which launched the military illogical Operation Steinbock earlier this year, the Japanese still believe that killing Chinese civilians from the air will advance their military goals. In support of Operation Ichigo, they drop incendiary bombs on Henyang and raid Liushu and Guilin in the end of July. While they kill more civilians in China, the sight of American bombers over the home islands finally shocks the Japanese into action. The government begins properly organizing the evacuation of children, and this time they make provisions for those who have no relatives in the countryside. Whole year groups are sent away to live together supervised by teachers. But outside of the largest cities like Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and Kyoto, this campaign moves very slowly, and by the end of September just 400,000 children will have been evacuated. On top of that, air defenses are still lackluster, and the resource-poor Japanese cannot make up for half a decade of neglect. Japanese radar systems struggle to detect high-flying aircraft. Even if the enemy is detected, the communications between the radar stations, ground-based observers, and fighter units is poor. There still aren't enough anti-aircraft guns to defend major towns and cities, and the guns that are in place are obsolete, as most of the Japanese fighters. For those who remain in the cities, there is little protection. The large public air raid shelters common in Britain and Germany are rare in Japan. The government has urged construction to begin, but cement and steel are in short supply. Most civilians make do with rudimentary trenches covered with wooden planks. For now, there is little to worry about, though. Like I said, a few B-29s flying over Kyosho are hardly a major threat. But we've covered how the Allied offensive bombing against Germany grew from small beginnings to a massive air assault with thousands of bombers raining fire and destruction. With the industrial might of the United States advancing towards the Japanese home islands, it is inevitable that the same evolution will happen. By the end of this month, the Mariana Islands of Saipan, Guam, and Tinian will be in American hands and construction of airfields will be well underway. From these airfields, the B-29s will be able to hit the whole of the Japanese mainland. The biggest Japanese cities, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, Kyoto, Yokohama, Kobe, and Hiroshima, which sit on the largest and most populous island of Honshu, will all be in range. Already, the American Joint Incendiary Committee has calculated that attacks on Honshu could inflict 560,000 casualties and destroy 20% of Japanese production. 
By the end of this month, 20th Bomber Command will also have a new commander, the hard-driving Curtis LeMay. He will sum up his opinion on targeting civilians after the war like this. There are no innocent civilians. It is their government. You are fighting a people. You are not trying to fight an armed force anymore. So it doesn't bother me so much to be killing the so-called innocent bystanders. In August 1944, LeMay is an accomplished and pioneering aviator and a veteran of the bombing war over Europe who has personally led his 3rd Bomb Division on dangerous missions over Germany. He's determined to improve the command's performance. It's a determination to drive home a flawed and brutal strategy that has already brought death and misery to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people across Europe. Now, the heavy bombers have millions more civilians in their bomb sites. There is about to be a whole lot more fire and destruction in this war. Never forget.